Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of VLGA Connect. It's the first in our local government cultural review series, and I'm delighted to be joined by the Minister for Local Government, Sean Lean. Hello, Minister. Hello. How are you going, Chris? Hi, Kevin. Very well, thank you. And joining me for this conversation with you is the CEO of the VLGA, Catherine Arndt. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Chris. Hello, Minister, and thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure, and thanks for having me a number of times um, since I've been in this position. It's uh, it's a great uh, opportunity to um, have a conversation with you, but I know um, uh, externalise our thoughts right through the sector. So thanks. Uh, thank you for being so accessible. And I know people look forward to hearing your thoughts on a range of things and we'll, we'll, we'll perhaps cover a couple of extra issues if we have time. Sure. But just to set the scene, uh, you announced quite some time back uh, that there would be a cultural review of the sector. I know Catherine has got a few questions to get into with you, but perhaps if you could just start by setting the scene for us, take us back to that decision you made to go down this path. It, it was just talking to a lot of um, councillors and also council staff, um, predominantly um, a lot of uh, female councillors that felt, and staff, as I said, and not necessarily, don't have, not necessarily all high level um, staff as well, where um, they felt that um, some, some of the environment, particularly uh, caused by um, elected representative councillors, um, is, is quite challenging um, in the sector. And um, so I, I felt that um, it, it's something, and getting back to, and I'll say this all the time, Chris and, and Catherine, and, and, and we know nothing new to hear, the local government sector does such great, fantastic work. And it's just too easy when there is an occasion of some really bad behaviour by a councillor. It might not always be a councillor, but when there's some really bad behaviour highlighted in the media, it kind of tarnishes a sector that, as I said, does fantastic work. It's, you know, a sector that has a huge budget, a sector that employs over 50,000, you know, plus workers that, you know, in the last 20 months, you know, they always, they've proved their worth time and time again, but they've really proved their worth, you know, in the last 20 months, you know, yeah. being redeployed into positions that they'd never thought they'd be in, supporting people in all sorts of ways. It's been fantastic. So I suppose a conversation I've had with a number of people in the sector is, you know, how do we sort of all get together and have a conversation about, can we get to one day where we just draw the line on what we're prepared to accept and what we're not prepared to accept. And so I thought maybe just, you know, it's not like this This is a discussion paper. It's not going to be Moses coming down from a mountain with, you know, 10 bits of stone with, you know, commandments on it. It's just a discussion paper for the sector. But I just thought let's, let's produce something that people can talk to and hopefully get to that point where, um, you know, this is what we expect from our councillors and, and others. This is what we expect from our councillors. Um, and uh, we, and this is how we're going to go about in the future to ensure that we don't get instances that have been highlighted in monitors reports and, and other, you know, sometimes in media. And one thing I'd, I'd really um, want to say, um, Chris and Catherine, is um, I don't want to see this paper or this discussion as the minister's culture review or the minister's paper. This is for the sector, and this is the opportunity for sector to own it if they wish. And this is an opportunity for the sector to draw that line in the sand. It might be in six months' time. But I am committed to the sector that if, there, if there's anything um, in, in my power, whether it be legislative reform in, in the next couple of years or whatever we need to do to assist, I'm committing that now. And I've committed that before. But I'd still want the sector to discuss, well, how can we, what ways can we grab hold of this as well? 
Thank you, Minister, for, for that summary, I guess, of the background of, of the discussion paper. You, you touched a little bit on it, but, but what's been the reaction of the sector when um, they did hear that you were launching this review into, into uh, culture? Yeah, it, it, it's been interesting, Catherine, that um, there's been, uh, yeah, I've spoken to the interesting conversation one councillor told me in front of actually a group of other people in the sector that um, she was involved in a discussion with the academics um, and PwC that have done this paper um, informing um, the discussion paper where she felt there was a lot of people sitting around with cross arms saying, there's nothing wrong, you know, why are we doing this? And she felt, um, and she actually said it in front of the group of people that I was talking to her with, that um, that she she thought they were kind of fooling themselves and, you know, and, and a bit disappointed um, that not everyone sees the world as she sees it, as least to have a go at, at you know, drawing a line in the sand one day. And, but there's been, look, I, I've had, um, I've had some passionate conversations with some councillors and, and, and staff from, from councillors that, that really want to seize the day. Um, they feel, yeah, and as we go into what the paper looked at, just the cost, the cost of dealing with one councillor that, you know, um, I think I've said it before, there's the odd councillor that runs for council because they hate their council and then they get elected. And then they spend the whole time hating their council and taking them, you know, to all sorts of tribunals and all sorts of stuff where the cost, it, the cost of the ratepayers in those areas could be huge. Um, so that's what this, that's one of the things this paper actually um, uh, explored. Well, I guess just, just on that, um, Chris and, and Minister, it's probably a, a good time now to, to, to have a look at what um, this discussion paper is putting out there and, and I guess invite you to go through that with us. Yeah, yeah, Catherine, and I'll, and I'll, I'll, try, and, I'll, I'll try and cover the main dot points if that's okay. So discussion paper centered around three key issues, roles, responsibilities, and support mechanisms. Um, what are the contributing factors behind the behaviors we see and what drives the culture and norms within the sector? Uh, the second key issue was councillor journey. What drives people to stand for local government and what do they experience through this their term? Uh, the third bit, with the third sort of key area was dispute resolution and conflict. Um, resolution, which is obviously a really important thing, and what are potential opportunities for early intervention, the preventions, as I mentioned before, about the paper actually has a really good uh, graph in it that shows the cost of, of, of issues lingering mm -hmm. to the council. Um, you know, it's a real eye-opening sort of um, visual where, that, you know, it would be no surprise to people who have been in the sector for a long time but just the cost. Um, and PwC in their research found the failure to address poor behaviour and misconduct on that theme early can result in, you know, it can, it can get out of control on a toxic culture, which leads to things like, and this will be no surprise too, increased staff turnover, loss of talent and quality qualified staff, impact on mental, emotional, physical, health and wellbeing. I, I spoke to a council not long ago about him and the number of people um, off on stress leave because of what was going on uh, within between council laws. Um, another issue that as far as this failure to address the behaviour early is um, diminished trust in the system and the local government sector. And I think I, we sort of touched on that when we first uh, had this conversation. Um, costs and legal fees of the council, which is, which is just a, like it, you know. I think that if the if the ratepayers saw what what was being spent and and you know the access to insurances and and what that means to insurance policy, it's just it's just um amazing really. It's just like eye opening. Um, and another a, a diminished performance and effectiveness uh, to meet community needs. Um, it did go. The paper poses a number of questions to the sector, for the sector. Sorry to consider not to the sector for the sector, including given the diversity and experience of candidates' backgrounds, 
how can uh, local government sector improve leadership capacity um, and better uh, cultivate an environment of transparency, honesty, integrity, and trust? Uh, another question was, what needs to change to better align councillors and mayors to effectively achieve community-based objectives and better operate as a diverse board of the community? How can the local government sector work to formalise a structured professional development pathway for councillors and mayors? In context of leadership, what needs to change to empower elected representative CEOs and council staff to call out for council, councillor behaviour and misconduct without fear of retribution? Very important question. And another question was, what types of early intervention mechanisms can be formulated and when? And what would an acceptable duration of time frame be for this intervention to fairly resolve a matter? So Minister, you've outlined some very relevant questions there that would be really helpful to get the mood of the sector on, if you like. One thing that jumps out at me, which you haven't mentioned yet, is the role of social media. The paper picks up on its role through the election campaign and this concept of pre-election, election period, post-election. Realistically, what do you think could be done sector? Are you expecting some out-of-the-box ideas on dealing with that issue? Oh, and absolutely, you're absolutely right. And the paper does does touch on that. And I think um, uh, I, I think that there could be looked at, um, at some agreed charter within the councils around, you know, when 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 um, you do you represent the council and when you when you don't. And mm. you know, some of the some of the you can have there can be decision making done, and then now or later someone from the council is. Like who was at the table, like you know, whether you, sometimes you, you like you know, with anything, and I don't expect councils not to not to um, not to robustly argue their point, and and there's always competing uh, priorities and interests, but it, you know, it seems a bit unfair to uh, get on social media and uh, uh, out a councillor in a certain way just because they disagreed with you on that matter. So I think there could be ways of agreed charters. Um, and that was certainly something, Minister, that came out of the Parliamentary Committee inquiry into the use of social media in, uh, in elections. So that covered not only local government, but also state government. That charter, that idea of a charter was yeah. something that was mentioned. Uh, and I know during the election period, I know the CMI and the DC have views around um, activities during the last election period, and we would or we could rely on their expertise to add to the conversation as well. I think they see themselves, you know, happy to be seen part of the sector and also, you know, part of the solution. And I think mm. this is this is sort of getting everyone that's involved to like you know take some ownership as well, take some ownership and 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 uh, work through how best to. Um, sort it through. The other thing the paper touched on um, and something that that I know I've sort of harped on a bit, you know, is that um, councils are set up to act as boards and have a consensus and work through issues where um, there was a bit of a, there was a misunderstanding of the, the other two levels of government, um, uh, what, what democratic process that they're actually set up as in a two-party uh, two adversary system where you have the question times and you have the you know the robust sort of a bit more robust debate where it is an opposition there to be an opposition there's no dead the, no one should feel like they at a council that they the dedicated leader of the opposition because I'm a, and it's I think that some people feel that way they where do where it's not, that's not the role. The role is to try and find a consensus as a board of a company, as I said, has a huge turnover and employs, you know, tens of thousands of people at some of the bigger councils. I mean, so that goes to the heart really of the issue of the understanding of the role before someone puts their hand up for it, let alone once they find themselves in the position. You know, I've known councillors that have been stunned to find out there's not a like a parliamentary privilege type equivalent for them to be in the chamber and say whatever they like. So there's a, 
there's a, a, a lesson in there, I think, around how we prepare people for the role. Would you agree? Oh, look, absolutely. And, I, and you know, I, I've spoken to some councillors that feel like, I think we really was like a pilot, the first um, candidate um, uh, training session, sorry, online uh, compulsory training. I felt like that was a pilot, and I think we can improve it a lot from the conversations that we've had with um, councillors since doing that. And, and also, um, you know, roles that the VG, the VLGA play and other big bodies, you know, I know if, I kind of feel like sometimes um, it's a great training system that you've got for candidates, but sometimes it's the people that are prepared to do your training aren't the ones that, that probably need to be targeted compared to others. So maybe we need to do some work about getting, you know, getting getting the message out that, you know, you can get him, you know, like, I mean, that's a, I, I don't know if that's a silly example I made before about some people running for the council because they hate the council, but I've seen a couple of instances of it. And getting back to, it, you know, your one issue you're, you're, you're really hating on is, is minuscule to what, you're going to have to deal with once you put your hand up and been elected. I absolutely um, note what you're saying. And, and, and I mean, there's also an education role, I think, for the voters and the community who, of course, um, see a campaign process being run when we do lead into a local government election. We see candidates running um, on single policy issues or perhaps advocating for a particular issue that a community member is passionate about. And yet, of course, when they're elected, um, they're unable to really bring that single issue into the, the, the council chamber because as you as you say, their role is to really govern like a board of directors on behalf of all stakeholders. So I guess the campaigning process is a systemic tension perhaps with um, uh, and may inadvertently reinforce the misunderstanding that councillors have um, about their role once they're, you know, in the, in the chamber. Absolutely. And, and I suppose that you go from the point of being a candidate to being elected and then you know within days the CEO is organizing uh, you know many many deep dives about you know everything you're going to have to deal with um, and and there's probably a bit of a culture shock there and it just goes to show you know look and then you know the responsibility of the CEO and the directors but also great responsibility in the Met for the mayor mm. I think and, and this is what I'd like for, for the sector to have a conversation about is, you know, does the mayor need more support? Does the, mayor, the mayors, you know, have they got the provisions to actually be able to um, keep, a, you know, things at a, at a great uh, workable board level? CEOs find themselves in difficult situations as well in, with the structure we've got. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's um, but in saying that, I feel like um, that if you're in the, if you're if you're in that position, I mean you just got to do the business. And getting back to getting back to the um, the optics in in that draft I spoke about about letting something get out of control, letting one councillor or maybe I mean, you know, one or two or whatever it is um, gets gets to a point where it's all out of control, the cost. The financial cost, the time, and the cost that you could lose some of your best employees, or they'd be off sick. Um, you know, it's a huge cost. So mm -hmm. there's there's a there's a you know there's a huge responsibility in those people in key positions. Minister, can I just raise another issue with you? The paper talks about the concept of a roaming monitor as a proactive tool to address issues before they become uh, significant issues. You've got three monitors in place currently. Are you deliberately sending a message that you want to be more proactive in heading off issues before they become perhaps irresolvable? Oh, the answer to that, Chris, is yes. I, I don't, I don't, like a monitor, I don't see monitors there to be 
to any sort of uh, level of, like to be something that councils would see as um, being in the, you know, getting punished or anything like that. Look, look, monitors are there to help. And I, I've said before, I, I, I think, you know, some things, there, there, might be, there might be occasions where like there, there's certain activity that's out of all of our controls as a sector, which leads the council to find themselves in administration. But when it comes to just, you know, certain behaviours, I, I want us to the point where we're never, there's never any council coming to our chamber to be put in administration. I want to so we can work as a sector and any, anything that I can do to support, people just getting back on track. So monitors have done some fantastic work in just helping. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to, I I want I I'm prepared to do something if I can. Why wouldn't I try something that may help and it might it might get things on track quite easily? We we've got a you know we've got a like we've got a monitor at a council that recently um, came out of administration probably don't even need to do it, but they're just there to help. Like you know with the makeup of the council sounds like everything's grown great. You know? So that's that's definitely a, I guess a, a change in well a, a welcome change in focus. I think the sector will see that um, as something that may have been viewed in the past as potentially punitive to something that's now um, uh, being seen as a preventative and supportive mechanism. Um, and I can only imagine that that will be most welcome. Minister, was there anything that really jumped out of out at you when the discussion paper came across your desk? Was there anything that you weren't expecting to see in there? Um, there's definitely still instances that are that are that you would, if you were a board member at a private sector company, you would no longer be a board member at that company. Mm, true, very true. So there, it sort of struck me that. Um, getting back to, I don't. It's only a discussion paper. I don't see it as you know the, the the fixing the world, but getting back to reinforcing that I think we should be having a crack at it. So where to from here? What what what's the process now? There'll be a chance to um, in, by February, and, and I apologise, but I think I can't think of the date. But uh, early February, mid February, if 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 someone wants to put in uh, a submission, a commentary around the discussion paper by then, we're opening it up just to say that, you know, PwC and the academics aren't saying that they know everything. So if anyone reads it and wants to add to it, distract from it, say what, you know, mm. their point of view, they can put submissions into it. And then after February and, you know, after we all have a Christmas break and we start, you know, back on deck, um, I'm really keen for the VLGA. I'm really keen for other peak bodies. I'm really keen for unions in the sector like the ASU. I'm really keen for any group that wants to host their own conversations about, you know, about what they think the discussion paper, what they think of it, uh, what they think could be the remedies. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll collate, um, you know, any, any advice we'll collate and then we'll have a conversation with yourselves again. I kind of want to challenge the sector, particular, you know, as in at a council council level, that there's probably a lot of things that the councils could do themselves. I, I don't want to, and I hope this doesn't sound like a cop out, but I, I kind of don't want um, the sector to completely look at the state government for all the answers and it should be in, in the act. And but I, I'm committed to looking at changes in the act to help. But I just kind of feel like. Um, you know, there's a lot of smart professional people in the sector that, that you know, that might not necessarily mean, need me to do anything for them. <laughs> I think I'm that. hearing you say you want the sector to own it, Minister. Oh, absolutely. Own it, but also, you know, anything I can help with. But, you know, I, I suppose what I said before is the best way to explain it. There's a lot of smart professional people in this sector that run huge organisations that I reckon are big enough and tough enough to find ways to, to find ways for us to get through this the best way we can. 
but um, but in saying that, not taking away at all my preparedness to support. Are you open to some of the left of field, perhaps slightly different sort of uh, suggestions that might come through the process, Minister? Oh, absolutely. And, and there's already been conversations I've had with the odd council that have put some really good things in place. You know, I, I, maybe this is why, too, that, you know, that, that sort of... Uh, conversation where a councillor told me there were some people with their arms crossed going, you know, what, you know, what's this bloke talking about? Well, I'm not, I'm never going to pretend to be an expert of the local government sector completely because there's been people there for decades compared to, you know, mm. so I can kind of understand that. But what I'm hoping is that this is a concern the sector brought to me mm. and some people very passionately. So I'm hoping is this the opportunity to draw that line in the sand for six months' time, if it takes 12 months, whatever it takes, but is this the opportunity to um, address what is a real concern out there? We'll confirm the details of that submission period time, and I understand post that closing date, you've outlined further consultations, and then a final report with recommendations for your consideration. Is that logically oh, that, what happens? Well, that's where we'll work towards we actually want to hear from the sector. Um, we want to hear from the sector what um, they think should happen from here. Getting back to this is a this is an opportunity to have the discussion, uh, and we want the discussion to end in um, suggestions. If it ends up in recommendations, we'll, we'll be open to, or personally be open to recommendations from from anyone in the sector. Uh, Chris, you mentioned there could be some really good left. Or left field ideas. It could be, you know, and 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 out and continue and and me continuing other conversations with yourselves and other peak bodies and, and other councillors. Um, you know, I think uh, I, one thing I learned during COVID is that um, our ministry and our government the two-way street conversations we've had with the local government sector, like with, with, we were at one point, we were meeting with the CEOs every week, our department, and we were bringing people from the health department. Mm. We we're bringing people from all sorts of, all the departments. And we were, we were learning off the sector some great ways to handle the crisis because this is the level of government that's closest to the streets and to the people and to the ground. And so it, and we, and the, and the information exchange obviously went two ways where, um, you know, where the, the councils were really hungry for the most up-to-date information and rightly so. So one thing I've learned is that, um, you know, we, we, sh we need to continue working in that fashion. Um, and uh, it, yeah, so we need to continue working in, in that fashion. Well, there will be times when um, the sector will won't be happy with um, uh, positions the state government have taken, and I fully respect that. And I fully respect the sector's right to get grumpy or push back, or you know, I fully respect that. And that, but that doesn't mean that we, you know. The day-to-day -day business that we both work in, we're both work with, with him, that we shouldn't just be constantly talking, advising and assisting each other because we've all got the same goal. Indeed. And, and Minister, the VLGA certainly looks forward to hosting many more of these conversations with you uh, and, in fact, hope to have uh, the uh, review panel, the academics and LGV, uh, talk at um, in a live panel session early in the new year on on this on this discussion paper, and we certainly make available um, you know our our podcast and and YouTube program to host any of those conversations you might want to have. Uh, that'd be fantastic, and, and I, I was I, don't worry, Catherine, I was lying on that, and <laughs> but also other other um, important players in the sector as well, like yourselves. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, we really appreciate that. And um, we've got a bit of gardening to do, but it's not, it's, you know, it's as far as the sector, the way the sector operates and supports the community is just fantastic. Thank you, Minister. Any final words, Catherine? 
Uh, look, I don't. Th I think you've covered off a lot today, Minister, and we've really appreciated the opportunity uh, to hear you talk through that discussion paper. And I did note that it contains some framing questions that I imagine um, stakeholders are being asked to answer when they consider the document and provide feedback specifically on those. Yeah, absolutely. And, and any, we we really welcome any support or any feedback um, on on you know where I suppose we're all trying to go with this yeah um and you know like I said it's a, it's not here discussion paper that you know I, I, I'm a, I'm quite an optimist and I think we can do some really there can be some really good outcomes um getting back to what you said Catherine you, you know the expectation is the sector to own it because I don't think you know there is people in the sector saying that they want to change and so, you know, I think if we work together, we'll find a way to improve just this small part. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it can be costly, it's a small part of the sector, but getting back to, it can be really unfair that one or two people can grab the, the headlines, the, head, the headlines away from the sector where there should be a lot more good news going out. Minister, I think we can leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Minister for Local Government, Sean Lean, for being our guest on this first of what we expect will be a number of special editions of VLGA Connect for the Local Government Cultural Review Series. Thank you. Thank you.